going to call the meeting to order. And uh, if you'll join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Brent, I'm sorry if I just kind of jumped in. Are you? Are we good? We are, but I need you to confirm that they can hear. Okay. Uh, we have two people, two counselors on uh, remote, on video. I can see both of them, uh, Counselor Lillard and uh, Counselor Meisner. Can we have a mic check, please? Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Marianne? Can you hear me? We can. Thank you very much. All right. Um, could I have a roll call, please? Steve Clemens? Here. Gary Lillard? Here. Here. John Bozar? Here. David Glabe? Here. Nicole is absent. Excused. Marianne Meisner? Here. Here. Justin Rock? Here. All right. Um, we're running a me meeting hybrid style. So some of our counselors are remote and some here are here at the di Obviously, we're here at the dais, right? Um, and that's just uh, it's a formality. It's happening across the state. Uh, COVID is not going away, and um, we're taking some precautions. Nothing on the dais for uh, agenda changes, and so we'll move right into the meeting. We have a consent agenda with one item, and that is uh, regular session minutes from June 1st. And um, I'll entertain a motion. I move we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. So motion and a second. Um, since we have people remote, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote on all items. So. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. Yes. John Bozarth? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, moving into public comments, uh, we have some introductions this evening. So, Chief Bell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. It's kind of exciting. Uh, I've, I've served the city for almost 30 years and this hasn't happened a whole lot. And so I appreciate the opportunity uh, and actually the ask uh, to bring our new public safety and, and staff to introduce to, to you. And um, I have two officers that, that we've recently hired with me tonight and I'm not trying to put them on the spot or embarrass them or anything, but I have a little bit of information that I'd like to share with you. Uh, Cody Billman, this is Cody. Uh, Cody Billman was hired and sworn in as a City of LeGrand police officer on Monday, May 9th. Officer Billman came to LGPD as a Oregon certified police officer. Prior to coming to uh, LeGrand, Officer Billman served for four years as a police officer in the City of Enterprise and four years as a corrections deputy with the Union County Sheriff's Office prior to that. Uh, just last night, Officer Billman completed his in-house field training and has achieved solo status as a LeGrand police officer. He will be covering a shift beginning this weekend. So uh, the value of hiring certified, experienced police officers, so less than two months, and uh, he's, he's going to be answering calls of service for himself. So we're excited about that. Thank you. We couldn't be happier to have Officer Billman as a member of the LGPD family and look forward to his continuing his law enforcement career and service to our community. So I would just like to personally welcome uh, Officer Billman and and introduce him to you. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I told him that that wasn't going to happen. But okay. Here's your microphone. <laughs> uh, Garrett Jones. Uh, Garrett was hired and sworn in as a City of LeGrand police officer on Wednesday, June 22nd. So not that long ago. Uh, officer Jones is a Montana native but has lived and worked in LeGrand for the last several years. Uh, Officer Jones is a veteran of our armed services, serving in the Army National Guard from 2014 to present with service in Iraq in 2019, uh, earning numerous commendations. Officer Jones is currently in field training and is scheduled to attend the 16-week basic police academy in Salem late this year or early next year. Uh, we couldn't be happier to have Officer Jones as a member of the LGPD family and look forward to his continuing law enforcement career and service to our community. So, Gary Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. 
Uh, Chief Cornford. Yes, you are. I was going to have Wyatt stay sitting. <laughs> So I'm happy to uh, introduce our newest hire. Uh, this is Wyatt Cunningham. Wyatt comes from uh, Coos Bay where he was raised and his father is a, a lieutenant for the Coos Bay Fire Department. So he's from a fire department family. He is married to his wife, Jordan, has a three-year-old daughter named Kyla. Um, he came from his career with Bay City Ambulance. So he's got some ambulance experience. He's currently a firefighter EMT and has plans to go to paramedic training for us. Um, he also has uh, an MBA in leadership and a BS in business administration. And he was a 2018 NCAA 2D or D2 academic All-American in track and field. So we're glad to have Wyatt with us. Legs and lungs. Yeah. <laughs> okay, never mind. Then. Different, different form. Yeah, so we're excited to have Wyatt here. Um, and uh, we have one more position that we actually are, we have a candidate in background, so that would put us to full staffing. Good, good. So, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Wyatt. It's a little drier here than Coos Bay. Yeah, a little old style. Why don't you leave a little early? Yeah. Nice meeting everyone. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Welcome to the community. Hi, I'm going to introduce our new recreation coordinator, but through uh, Michaela Rollins, our aquatic and recreation. Uh, what's your name, superintendent? Um, so uh, this is the chain of command. See, I'm trying to teach you guys. So you don't call me, just call her. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Chris John Andrea came to us from uh, Arizona, but he, he grew up around here. And uh, I'm going to let Michaela do the rest because she has, she has eloquent speech prepared. So, Michaela I, Rollins. I do not um, so, my name is Michaela Rollins. Um, Chris is our, like Stu said, our new um, rec coordinator. He has been fantastic. Um, Chris, do you think you've worked two and a half weeks, maybe? Maybe. Two. Um, Two, three, four weeks. Yeah. Uh, he has hit the ground running and has been fantastic. He's going to be a great addition to our team. And I know that our community is just going to love his projects. Um, he's already had some really great ideas and uh, super happy to have him. Good. Excellent. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. All right. No more presentations. Anybody wish to address the council on non agenda items? Please come to the podium. There's a form in the back. If you haven't filled it out, you should get to it before you leave. Okay. And all we need to know is your first name. Okay, Jim. Okay, Jim. Go for it. Eritola. Uh, I needed to talk to you, that new kid that you just hired. Pickleball courts. There's none in the grand. There's no. Pickleball. Pickleball. Is that the big wall and you hit it? No. No? It's, it's a net. Four people paddles. Okay. It's big. I mean. Enterprise, I heard, has pickleball courts. Baker has them. Pendleton has them. Ontario has them. We have, I've painted two out at the country club. But there's a lot of people that don't want to go out to the country club because they don't belong. And But the country club will let people go out there for nominal fee and stuff. But people just don't feel comfortable. We have brand new tennis courts. I don't know if there's a, any agreement with the high school. I, I, I'm not aware, but I, I might hit up Stu about this. But. Or I've, I've checked in with Coleman Courts, and I've been shut down numerous times on that. A pickleball court, I painted. It's orange. Coleman Court, the basketball courts are black. If you don't know the difference between a pickleball court line and a basketball court line, you probably should play either one. It would just be something for the city to... Think about them. Okay. So thank you. Might be something to give to Parks and Rec Commission. See that, if they can. That, that's talk what about I it. talked to. Yeah. I went out and, and actually showed them on Coleman Court where the pickleball court would lay on a basketball court. And and that's and that you uh, Coleman is the one over in Pioneer. By the pool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else wish to speak to the council? All right. Moving ahead, then we have a public hearing. Um, the hearing was opened. 
uh, for the ordinance to be read. As, um, wait a second. Um, it, well, we opened this public hearing at the June meeting. This is a uh, continuation when we'll uh, have a reading for the second time and we will vote on this. Um, the rules of order were read at the public hearing in June. And with that, uh, staff report, anything to change, Mike? Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, there are no changes. This is the uh, adoption of the uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan. It's a comprehensive plan amendment. And uh, uh, we've had discussion. Uh, we had a work session and we had discussion at the last council meeting. Uh, there are no changes. It's a second reading. Uh, after your decision tonight, if, if it's adopted, uh, uh, I'll be submitting an application to Union County for co-adoption. Okay, so the process then after tonight, if it get passes, it goes to Union County. They go through something similar, a couple of readings, and then we get it put into play. Well, it's after tonight, there's a 30-day window of, there's an appeal period for the city component, okay. and then it'll actually go into effect for the city. Um, and then I'll be applying uh, uh, to the county for co-adoption so that uh, uh, it would apply within our urban growth boundary. I don't know, other than maybe Riverside Park, I don't know if we really have, uh, maybe the trail. I don't know if we have any urban growth boundary parks that uh, would apply uh, about, in this plan, but there are some elements that uh, would be applicable. What about Morgan Lake? Does that fall into that? Uh, it's it's in the plan, but it is actually in the county. It's not in our urban growth boundary, but it, it does help with our uh, uh, parks in, in applying for grants by having it in our master plan. Okay, good. Uh, any question for Mike? And I see Stu move to the dais. Yeah. Any questions for either one of them? I got to remember to look up at um, at our counselors online. So anything from from you all? No. Okay. Stu, can I? Um, sure. Some of the language in here, I, the substance, I think, is not a problem from my perspective. I would change some of the writing. For instance, your name by name in this document. I don't know that that's what we want in a master plan. I think if we say parks director instead of Stu, that's probably a better way. There's a few things like that that I wouldn't mind seeing altered before this becomes a final document. I don't know if that's something when that would happen or, or how, but just without being nitpicky, there's a couple of places where the grammar is a little bit incorrect. Um, some things that I would just fine tune before this is adopted as a full master plan. So on housekeeping things like that substance is not changing but language is could we can we pass it this evening and uh and then assume that those things will be taken care of i think so mike yeah yeah i don't see any reason why not i would include that in your motion uh, as long as it doesn't change the number of pages and the content hasn't changed <laughs> then uh, uh as part of the final ordinance, when it's printed, I can make sure that uh, the page numbering and, and everything matches the uh, the ordinance that you're adopting. Okay. But those are those are minor things, and uh, but but certainly include the changes uh, of changing the uh, Stu's name to, to just referring to the parks director. All the grammatical stuff is an easy fix that I could do. You you good with that, Dave? I'm good with that. Okay. Any other questions for Stu? All right. Um, public testimony. Anybody like to speak to this item? I think we have a couple of uh, Parks and Rec Commission commissioners here. All right. Council, council comment to discussion. Okay. Without uh, hearing anything, I'll close the public public hearing and entertain a motion. Um, making sure that when that motion happens we put some verbiage in there about uh, any uh, housekeeping changes that might that need to be done so inter entertain a motion on that i Go. move that the proposed ordinance amending the city of la Grand comprehensive plan for adopting a comprehensive plan and adopting a parks and recreation master plan be read for the second time by title only put to a vote and adopted uh, along with, uh, I guess, grammatical changes. That work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and fixing Stu reference to the parks director. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Um, could I have a reading of the ordinance for the second time by title only? 
an ordinance of the City Council of the City of LaGrande, Union County, Oregon, amending the statewide goal chapter eight of the City of LaGrande comprehensive plan, recodifying the comprehensive plan, repealing ordinance number 3250 series 2020 and all other ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith and declaring an effective date. All right, we've got a reading of the title only. The only thing I wanna say is to thank the, the Parks and Rec Commission for the work that they've done on this. Uh, it's a good plan. It'll carry us through the next uh, five to 10 years. So thank you. Uh, with that, I'll ask for a roll call vote, please. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. Yes. John Bozar? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, no new, no unfinished business. We have four items of new business, the first of which is a resolution adopting commercial historic dis district design standards. Uh, as a reminder, the council held a work session to go over this. It's been a work in progress for a while. Um, with that, I'll ask uh, Mr. Boquist for a staff report. Well, I don't know if I have anything to add, Mayor. I think you got it covered. But yeah, so th this is a, a project that was funded by a, uh, a state historic preservation uh, certified local government grant. Uh, and it takes our current historic standards that are outdated and uh, updates them to uh, be a little more user friendly, uh, take out a little bit of the interpretation and gray area to kind of help with consistency. And, uh, and, and hopefully it'll be much more user friendly for applicants as they uh, try to navigate uh, the process for uh, improving their historic buildings. Uh, we did have a work session on this in May. Um, the council asked for a couple amendments to be made, uh, which were incorporated into the uh, report. Uh, um, specifically, uh, one of those was adding some references uh, and some quick links to uh, resources uh, to make it easier, at least in the electronic version, uh, for uh, for folks to uh, quickly jump to a resource that's referenced in there rather than having to manually go find it somewhere. Um, so, um, so anyway, so that's what we have. Uh, the resolution tonight will, uh, if, if you support it, will adopt it and it'll go into effect. And our Landmarks Commission is scheduled to meet tomorrow night for a work session to start uh, the next process which is a recommendation the council had at the work session, which was to kind of craft or develop a uh, potentially three or four different streamlined application processes for the different uh, types of historic buildings in order to make it easier for somebody to navigate the process so they're not given a full packet with every scenario that applies. They, they can be given an application packet that's specific to the type of project that they're that they're seeking to accomplish and so we're we're going to we're not sure how that's going to look as we go through but tomorrow night will be the first work session to start outlining that and the brainstorm and figure out how are we going to prepare and present that uh, as we move forward do you have any questions um i don't have any questions specifically i just wanted to comment that one of the things i really liked about this was that sort of the matrix of being I, um, of linking the type of building that someone owns to the set of standards. Um, and to me, that made a, it made the process a lot easier. And then the idea of having um, um, individual applications for those kinds of buildings made, made a lot of sense. So, yeah. Um, any, any council questions for, for Mike? I don't have a question. I have uh, some comments I would like to make. Okay, Gary, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I've had a chance to look this over since our work session. I'm really not very happy with it. Uh, we, we're indicating that this was supposed to uh, make some things less vague, uh, a little more easy for people to sort out. I don't see that it's accomplished that. In fact, as I went through it, I, I could hardly find a page where it didn't include some prescriptive language that was so vague and so subjective that would really depend on who's looking at it and who is providing the definition for it. Uh, I, I'm finding it hard to understand why we didn't link a little more closely to the state and federal documents that pertain to this. Now, <clears throat> granted, you're looking at much larger documents. I think it's the federal one that's 
you know, well over 200 pages. But as I looked at it, it's well indexed. I didn't have any problem finding particular items that I, I tried to look up. And within that document, they have columns that are very specific about what you can do with a particular issue, a particular building, or what you can't do. And I would have thought that that would be the direction that we would be headed if we want to be more helpful to people who are trying to to use this document. I, I don't think this one cuts it at all. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought that was the purpose to make it a little bit easier for people to work with their buildings. Because well, I think standards. that was the purpose, but I don't see how this accomplishes that. You have to be specific and not so vague and so subjective if you're going to make it easier for people because now they're subject to the whims of whoever is defining certain pieces of language. Same problem, basically, we had with the, the previous policy. Anybody else? Just so I'm clear on this. We, we were given two versions of this. The first version is the corrected version. Yeah, what you have in your packet, yeah, on the front, on the front yes. of your packet is the corrected version okay. that has the changes that right. the council asked for. In the back of your packet is the legislative version that has the strike through and the, mm -hmm. uh, it's the same version. It just has, it just has your changes incorporated. So, so it's, it's not, and there, there are some interesting weird wording changes uh, in there. There's a couple of them. I'll point out one. This is this is bizarre, but like uh, my name happens to be on page two and it says council. It says counselor in the first one. In the revised one, it says council and everybody else says counselor. It, uh, there's some odd things like that. And I'm like, where did that come from? So that's what I was confused about is which one of these is the corrected document? I can see the changes, but the changes here amounted to some, and I I admit I didn't go through this with a fine tooth comb and, and you, you know, every single word, but there are some bizarre things like that that I noticed between the two as I was comparing back and forth. So somebody needs to go through this with a fine tooth comb and make sure that, that those things are matched up. Okay. And I'm, you know, I'm going through it probably in the detail that, that Gary, uh, that Gary has, uh, and I, I have not looked at what the federal uh, standards are. If, if the intent is for this, be a set of standards and there's still some ambiguity in terms of what people have to do versus what they can do um, that that concerns me because I think we want something that as John mentioned that's relatively simple and straightforward but also has the details and the guidelines and the standards that when somebody comes in, they say that building needs to be done this way. Well, or, and if I might, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gary. Go ahead. If I could interject a little bit there, uh, part of my concern over this is because if people want to obtain certain grants from state or federal, they've got to meet the standards that are in those particular documents. And if for some reason that doesn't happen, because they were looking at something that was much more vague, much more general. Maybe they didn't get good information about what they were going to need to do or not do. They may wind up not, not being able to get the grants or what have you that they were hoping to get. If I recall, Mike, this, this was done through a consultant. Correct. Yeah, and we had a discussion about this ambiguity as part of the work session and, and and the, the discussion that the consultants had is, is we don't want to be that specific because there are too many different types of buildings in our downtown. And if we get that specific, then some buildings the standards will work for, but other ones we're going to be so strict they won't be able to do anything. And so having the flexibility with some suggested language gives us the flexibility to offer them flexibility in how they restore their building. And uh, I think the consultants did a good job with providing guidance on here's what the standard is. And there's not very many of them, frankly. What, what the bulk of the substance is, is there's a standard. I'm just looking at A2 as an example for new additions. There's a standard and then there's A through G. Um, 
examples of how do, how do you achieve this standard? Here's, here's some ways to achieve that. And so then it provides that guidance for somebody to achieve it. Um, and so each standard is different and they have different suggestions, but that, but that was the conversation the consultants had with, with the group was we want that subjective language to some degree so that we have the opportunity to be flexible and offer, um, you know, alternatives for folks to meet well, the standards for their project. Before we brought in the consultants and we had work sessions, we always talked about flexibility and they just reinforced it as far as I'm concerned and did a great job. And I think we need that flexibility and you go to the strict standards and it hurts our darn downtown more than helps. Well, could we not just put a comment in there that if you are going for a grant, check the federal or the state standards? Um, I don't know if we need to put a comment necessarily in our standards, but we do coordinate with applicants as they go through that, because we do encourage them to apply for state and federal grants when they're available. There are some tax incentive programs that we then steer them towards the state for. And most folks, when they're doing a historic preservation process, are working with, you know, the state historic preservation office on the on those specific standards because they are many of them are doing them specifically to get those tax credits and so, uh, and and the state has a higher level of requirements than the local jurisdiction and they should um, we should not be more strict than the state in this circumstance well then can it be on the application just to remind them again if they're going for a grant to check those other standards yeah, we could certainly incorporate that into the application process because one of the things that came out of the work session was in addition to the application packet is that we also attach resources for applicants uh, um, you know, to look at. So there's historic preservation briefs. There's a number of things that, uh, that are available that uh, we're going to be um, providing an applicant related to their project so that we don't have to incorporate all of the standards the state has because gary's right there's a lot of information and if we adopted all of that i don't i think staff would be almost as overwhelmed as the applicant if we uh, went to that level so uh, but but we will be providing that level of resource to to applicants so we can certainly put something in the application packet that provides that guidance marianne okay thank so you the problem the problem Go ahead, Gary. I'm seeing the problem I'm seeing with the so-called flexibility, which I think I would uh, define as subjectivity, is that you might have person A now identifying some of those vague subjective things one way. Five or ten years from now, person B may not see it the same way. Uh, I, I guess I can foresee that being an issue. I can, you know, it, I think you're always going to get a different perspective depending on who's looking at it and what their background is. It depends I, on how specific the conditions are. Right. I, but I, 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 you know, as I, as I'm recalling the the work session and and just scanning through some of the uh, the standards that we've got here, the the question, you know, throw this hypothetical out. Somebody comes in with a. Uh, uh, a historic non-contributing and that puts them in a certain you know category of standards um for instance standard a there's one two three four five six seven eight nine different options they're not restricted to one of those options but you could mix and match within those options is that correct as long as they were, you know, as long as you were not going beyond those nine items. And I'm, I'm looking at page 14 of the newest one. Yeah, and so, so standard A is, um, is storefront or standards for existing buildings. Yeah. And so A1 is the is storefront rehabilitation and it gives you a standard, which is preserve, restore, reconstruct missing primary features as part of your uh, rehabilitation. Then it's then the rest of it, A through I, or the following can help achieve this this standard. Right. And so yeah, so not all of those will apply to every project because it depends on what their project is. And so depending on what their project is, 
you know, two or three of those might apply. Right. So you could, you can, the, the, the idea is, and I, I see Gary's concerned about interpretation and, and the, maybe the over flexible um, conditions or, or you know, over flexible standards that may be here. But at the same time, the application that you, that they pick up and they look at, um, should be adequate to guiding them towards the right collection of standards. Yeah, that's that's the intent. And just for some, I guess, a little background, when we first started this in February of 21, that that was one of the concerns that Councillor Glabe raised was, um, was that we had challenges with consistency and we needed something more specific so that we ended up with a, a process that an applicant can predict. They could go through the application. Uh, they can go through the standards. They can uh, essentially develop a design that they are fairly confident would get approved. And, and then we can kind of go through that. Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, we've achieved that. The, the challenge that we have in going through the standards is when you look at all the different types of buildings we have in our downtown, it's really difficult to create. It's the same thing with the land use standards throughout the whole city. It's really hard to create a one size fits all standard that applies to every building, because while you may provide something great and flexible for one property, you essentially kill every project that's possible for another one, or you'll make something possible for another project that uh, is super flexible and, and works. And then all of a sudden you have something that is very historical. You want to preserve and you allow it to be destroyed. And so having, I think the standards we came up with is I think the best we're going to be able to do at the moment. I think we're going to have to try it. And if we don't like it, we could change it. That's the nice thing about having the standards in a resolution is it's not a complicated process to change. And we can refine this as we go. Um, you know, it's not exactly what we intended in the beginning, but I think it evolved as we went through and, and we realized we can't make it as strict as we originally thought or we originally wanted because there are some unintended consequences that go with that. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that's what we kind of discussed at, at the end of the work session. And and that's why we have the product we have. It, it might not be perfect, but I think it's the best. It's, the, it's better than what we have. It how, might not be perfect. How, Mike, how often... Are you, do you anticipate applying this standard two, three times a year, or is it going to be more active than that? I, this is, well, I think it depends on the number of applicants that come through, because when we have facade grants for urban renewal, a lot of those are historic properties, and this standard or this set of standards uh, would be applied to every one of those projects. A lot of the call for projects that are in, that are in the downtown this set of standards would apply to them as well. And, and only the standards that are applicable to their project, right. whether it has to do with an alley restoration or a storefront or an upper floor, depending on what they do. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I, I hear what Gary's saying, but I, I actually was fairly pleased with a lot of the revisions that they made, you know, based on what we suggested the last work sessions. For instance, you'll notice that a lot of the changes are, are wording changes. Instead of may, they'll say are. And, and I felt like this struck a pretty good balance, like you're describing, Mike. You know, it, it, it allows for some flexibility without, uh, without too much flexibility. Um, you know, it is a bulkier document than the original one, but I feel like it's accessible. Um, I feel like particularly if, if, you know, staff is willing to work with people and, and, and say, hey, you've got this kind of building these are the standards you want to look at. Again, for many of these, they'll they'll only be reading a quarter of the document. And I personally, I felt like it did a pretty good job striking that balance. Um, this is a little bit of my background as an editor coming in, but I we do need some polishing on this. Um, the PDF version that was supplied, I'm assuming that that's going to be similar to what the electronic document that is provided. There are places where the graphics covered up text. There's places here even on the PDF where the text is illegible because of, so there's some polishing that needs to be done from that perspective. But, but I hear what you're saying, Gary, but I, I felt like this this is a pretty good balance uh, from my perspective. I, I would be comfortable with this. So before we go too much further, I'd like to know if any 
anybody in the audience would like to speak to this item, public comments on this. All right, I, I just wanted to catch that before we went any any further. Um, anybody else have a, any comments on this? I will say this, that I, I liked the, the format. I liked the idea. It was sort of a, a, a key to, uh, for, for users, if your building fits this particular category, then the standards that you need to follow are this and this. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that achieved what we had, we were talking about in our work session, what we were looking for. Um, I also think that a little bit of flexibility is not that bad a thing, as long as there's some boundaries within that flexibility. Um, and that those boundaries are clearly delineated in this document, then I think we're, we're good to go. Any other discussion or conversation? If not, I'll entertain a motion on this item. Can we include in that that we make sure we take care of the graphics so that it is a fully legible document? Yeah, I'll work on that because I'll, I'll look at my version because I, I have a version in my office. That, and that's what I wasn't sure. It looks clean, the, and so I'm not sure how, how you're shows the problem and then the electronic one did too so i i'm assuming it, it's something that needs to be revised yeah, yeah i'll review that if, yeah, if you want to include that in your motion that'd be that'd be fine yep all right anybody want to make a motion to that effect i move that the proposed resolution adopting the commercial historic district standards be read by title only put to a vote and pass and also mike looking over and ensuring that everything is legible correct yeah, because it'll be an attachment to the resolution, and so I'll uh, I'll I'll make sure it's a clean version for the the final. Perfect. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, with that, I'll ask the city recorder for a reading of the uh, the title of the resolution. The resolution of the city council of the city of Lagrand, Union County, Oregon, repealing resolution number four five five seven series two zero zero nine, adopting commercial historic district standard design standards and repealing all other resolutions or parts of resolutions in conflict herewith. All right, we've got a motion, a second, and a reading of the title only. Uh, any other comments before we move on to a vote? Can I have a roll call vote, please? Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? No. John Bozar? Yes. David Glade? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, second item of new business is a resolution considering an annexation of property on Guildcrest Drive. Mike, this is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So this is a routine request. This is a property that's in our urban growth boundary that uh, is currently uh, under development, and they are seeking. Uh, uh, water and sewer services from the city and and the city ordinance requires annexation in order to get those services and uh, anyway so we have that request from that owner uh, to be annexed so that they could be connected and that's up off of 12th street correct yeah it's at the top of 12th street okay yeah it's a new service line i think it went in last year to accommodate a couple other properties that uh, you also uh, considered for annexation last year and what at what well, if it's being annexed, eventually we, the line of the city limits would change to incorporate those those properties. Yeah, each time it changes, and and I mean there are some opportunities where folks could be forced through the annexation process if we wanted to do something larger, but uh, we've I guess administratively or collectively decided that uh, forcing annexation is not uh, our goal or intent, and so okay. we are. Uh, uh, only considering annexations upon request when the property owner comes to us for a service we require annexation in order to uh, provide it to them okay questions for mike on this yeah the only thing i had mike i'm assuming that the the lighter red line shows on parcel uh one and or two and three that means that's going to be that's part of the city limits now you've extended the city limits up and around to the the line that has kind of like a highlight on it is that correct uh, the uh, the gray line is the city limit line, so that yeah. parcel uh, two is is out of the city limits. And oh. so, Gilcrest Drive is in the city limits, and 
you know, so it's a little confusing in that area because that area on the north side is an island that is surrounded by city limits. Okay, so but the map you're only seeing a sound bite. But the map that's here shows just little red streaks across parcel two and three. So by annexing that in, we're going to be extending the city limits to include them. Only the shaded gray parcel. Are you looking at the exhibit A map? I am. Yeah, so tax lot 602, which is shaded in gray, is yes, the okay. parcel that's highlighted to be annexed. And so the that um, red line, it's actually a heavy gray line that okay. lays over the red. Anyway, okay. that will then jog around that parcel 602 and bring it into the city limits. Okay, yeah, because I was looking at parcel two and three that's right on Gilchrist, that's facing okay. Gilchrist. Yeah, I was looking at the other... Oh, I see which ones. Those are already in the city limits. I'm, I'm yeah, following. That's what I there's, okay. Those are all. Yeah, there's a number of parcel twos and threes, depending on what the partition yeah. was and what year it was. Okay. Well, that's what I was looking at the wrong parcel number. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Mike, what's the red slashed line? What does that indicate? Because it, it's like all over the place. Yeah, so these are different land divisions off of the county uh, assessor map. And so, so that's what you have as an excerpt off of this, because this is what I submit to the Department of Revenue. And so that's why it's in here as the exhibit is to kind of make it clean for everybody. Okay. The gray shaded line is, is a line that I added to uh, better reflect the city limit boundary okay. and, and where this is going to go. So, so all those little red hash lines are either subdivision or parcel type boundaries, or it might be a tax boundary of, of some sort in some cases, but. Okay. All right. Uh, any question? Any other questions for Mike? Public comments on this item? Motion? I move that the proposed resolution annexing property located at 1607 and 1609 Yield Crest Drive be read by title only, put to a vote, and passed. Second. Motion and second. Could I have a reading of the proposed resolution by title only, please? A resolution of the City Council of the City of La Grande, Union County, Oregon, declaring certain territory annexed to the City of La Grande, Union County, Oregon, specifically property at 1607 and 1609 Gilcrest Drive, Township 3 South, Range 38 East, Section 17 BD, Tax Lot 602. All right, we've got a motion, a second, and a reading of the title. Any other comments or discussion? Pretty routine stuff here. Roll call vote, please. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. John Bozarth? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, third item of new business authorizing the city manager to sign an interagency agreement with the Grand School District for use of Pioneer Park ball fields. This is uh, Mr. Spence. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So essentially, uh, the school district came to us with their big investment of the, the turf infield, uh, infields and said, we want to contribute annual dollars to the replacement cost of that, which is generally about 10 years. So the reason this agreement was created essentially was for that to be in writing and agreed upon. We took that opportunity to clarify a few more things uh, within our relationship. And um, we also have an annual, uh, agreement that we enter into that talks about park rules and behavior and expectations and things like that when it comes to actual uh, league play with, with baseball and softball. And as you know, the school district plays all their baseball and softball at Pioneer Park. So um, any questions? The only question I have, Stu, is under the explanation about the middle of the paragraph, it says, as of this writing, the proposed language has yet to be finalized. Attached is a draft which contains the language of this writing. My, I'm concerned about, about passing a draft unfinalized agreement. Yeah, so the update to that is that it, it's now been finalized and approved by the district. Okay. But one comment in that document was the one that we were still talking about, and it's been resolved. And that, so, com and that comment is... If you look, put, flip to, sorry, I got on my phone. Jeez. It's on, it's okay. on the page. Go ahead, Marianne. Oh, it's, okay. it's not, the page number's not made or marked, but. Okay, the highlighted one, repairs to damage that yeah. occurred during the district. Essentially, the, 
they were concerned that they would be held liable for spectators causing damage to the park. And we, our perspective is that if you rent the park, it's your responsibility for those spectators, which is already in that other annual agreement that we execute every year. And once I pointed that out to the district that they already have agreed to that for the last several years, they said this comment is fine the way it is. So as it is in writing is the final draft. But when we had to do the deadline, because Stacy's, you know, like heart hounded me about packets, then we didn't quite have that clarified yet at the time of the packets. Okay, good. Thank you. So Nick. sorry, that's convoluted. But that's yeah. that's the only clarification I need. Yep. Yep. Questions that, for? Yeah, Go ahead. That, was my, that was my only con concern too, because I thought they should be responsible if they are renting that the space at the time. Yep. Okay. And ultimately, they always are, and they always have been. It's just that they were unclear about that until I pointed that out. Okay, good. Any other questions for, for Stu? Public comments on this item. A motion. I move that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. I move that we authorize the city manager to finalize and sign an interagency agreement with the LeGrand School District for the use of Pioneer Park baseball and softball fields. Second. Any other comments or discussion? Roll call vote, please. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. Don Bozarth? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All just, right. Just one more comment, if I could, Mayor and Council. The, uh, you'll see an EOU agreement similar to this coming down the pike in the next month or two. They're working on that. It'll be a shorter term agreement because they have plans to build their own facilities. The school district does not. Just an FYI. Okay. Thank you. All right, next item of new business is appointing citizens to some commissions. Uh, this is my job. Uh, the first appointment is to the Arts Commission. Uh, there are currently three vacancies, and we have one applicant. Um, so I move that uh, Ricky Joe Hickey be appointed to the Arts Commission for the remainder of a three-year term, which will expire December 31st, 2024. And I need a second on that. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. John Bozarth? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All right, the second appointment is for the Planning Commission, a very uh, critical commission when it comes to getting things done in, in the city. Um, there are currently two vacancies, and we have two applicants. Um, I'm going to I'm going to butcher this one, but it's is it Gowerty? Gowerty? Not sure. Is that, is that about right? His last name Matthew. Sure, sure it sounds okay. Like <laughs> um, I move that Matthew Gowerty and Roxy Ogilvie uh, be appointed to the Planning Commission for the remainder of a. Okay, I got to do I gotta two of them separately, so I'm going to do. Um, Matt, for appointment to the Planning Commission for the remainder of a four-year term, which will expire December 31st, 2025. And Roxy, be appointed for the remainder of a three-year term, which will expire December 31st, 2024. Second. Discussion and comments? Roll call vote, please. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. John Bozarth? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, moving on then. Commissioner Scarfo, give us an update. Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I only have a few things. Uh, we had our Cascadia exercise last week. It was fantastic. I really wanted to thank the city for their involvement. Uh, Mr. Spence, Mr. Carpenter, uh, City Fire, and uh, City Police Department for being there. It was uh, it was, it was new for me to be in one of these exercises, and we are in good hands. Uh, I hope there isn't a Cascadia event that will happen. That's very scary. But if it does, we are we are in very, very, very good hands. And I want to thank you very much for participating in that exercise. It was uh, well needed, and the only one that's happened in the state for you know, as far as I know. Oh, so uh, the other thing is N E O E D D Northeast Oregon economic development district is trying to get out postcards to everybody in union county what is going on here is there's a uh, federal dollars coming to oregon in the amount of 
possibly $1 billion for broadband. And to do the legwork on, on getting these funds, and there's three ways the funds can be used, as, or I'm sorry, two ways, is if you have bad broadband, no broadband, or uh, can't afford broadband or internet services. So I guess there are three. And these funds are supposed to help that out. So these postcards are gonna go out in the near future, and we just really wanna get everyone in Union County to fill these out, call the number, and do tests in your own home to, to see if there is a need for broadband uh, or cost of broadband, because if, if there is, then this funding is coming to the state of Oregon, and we'd love to have that here to help us out for that. Good. So that would be, I, I think we're pretty set within LeGrand because we've got fiber and we've got cable, but this would be out in the county. This, but if if anyone is, is struggling in the city of LeGrand with uh, bandwidth, okay. or I don't know the, the, the terms, I'm doing my best yeah, yeah, on, yeah. They, I'm, you know, not uh, Zipply. Yeah. Zipply fiber? Yeah, yeah Zipply. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. It will soon be. Anyway, yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah. But uh, I, I would just encourage everybody, fill it out. Uh, the responses would, or would be fantastic for uh, uh, hopefully getting some funding here to help out with, with internet. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, the county did pass today that we're helping out with uh, half of that. Cost, it's a, it's a big cost, it's like over $4,000 to get postcards out, if you could imagine postage and all that. But if you do, you know, the, the city of LeGrand, if you get them, please uh, contribute best you can. And I mean, the other thing too is, that, like I said, Mayor, is the cost. If you can't afford it, this, this funding can help with the cost. So if you can't afford to have internet services, this, this also can do that, so. Cool. That, that would, would that mean ongoing service charges or just to get it to your house these these are federal dollars and I, I don't know what strings are attached i just know it's a lot that's coming in and we're, we're doing the legwork first before the application process starts gotcha okay so good. Good. that's i have any any questions any questions for commissioner scarfo i have one yes go ahead gary yeah uh matt a few days ago the state released some data to media regarding the COVID uh, rate of new infections uh, by county. Uh, it wasn't, you know, total number of cases, but based more on percentages, that type of thing. Based on that, I think the worst county in the state at this point at number 36 is Sherman County, but Union County is in kind of some trouble too at number 29. In fact, the CDC just came out and indicated that our county is one among a number in the state that they are now recommending that we go back to masking when we're indoors. I was just wondering if the county had any plans in response to, to this information. Yes, when we had that spike last week, actually, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, and it was in the front page of the paper, I did, uh, I talked to public health, uh, Kerry Bajati, uh, the health, the public health director, and also called the hospital to see where we're at, because I really wanna make sure that our resources are available and Carrie did send me a, a link today, which I could forward on to the city council if you'd like to see where we're at. And right now, um, it's kind of hard to think back on where we were when there was like two ICU beds open and our resources were low. And yes, our cases are up, but we have 50, it, it changes a lot, but it's, we have right now we have 52 ICU beds available in our region. So I'm really looking at the hospitals right now and how we could we could help this, but the, the spread, uh, I you know it, it it's there. I I've seen it a lot worse, but everyone like I have I said from the very beginning, you have symptoms, stay home. I think that's that's the best best thing I could say to anybody right now. We we all know the you know wash your hands, you know wear a mask if you are high risk. Be careful where you're at. I've been saying it for too long now, you know, almost three years now. So we, 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 we know how to not spread this disease and, and that, and that's where we're at, I believe. Unfortunately, it's, it's still being spread. And that's it will, it will, it's a virus and following viruses yep. routes until we reach herd immunity. That's, that's where we're at. Yep. And, you know, the vaccines did help with uh, keeping hospitalizations low. 
but that's one thing that we, we do know for sure, that uh, symptoms were re reduced with the vaccines. Right. Well, and also the variants are, are not as tough on you as the, as they have been in the past. I'm, I'm glad that people are confused with allergies and COVID right now. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. I will take that. Okay. Any other questions for Commissioner Scarpa? Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, Gary? Uh, give me a call. Thank you. You bet. Staff comments? Uh, just wanted to let you know the restroom at Morgan Lake on the south end of the lake, if you haven't been there, is up running. And uh, the ADA parking pad, thanks to Public Works, has helped in the entire project. Thanks, Kyle. I know you're watching at home. Um, very um, great project, great uh, funded by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and State Marine Board. Uh, there's no restroom facilities on that end of the lake until now, so I'm excited that they're accessible and open. Follow that. <laughs> I don't know. That's talking about a restroom doesn't seem like it's going to be hard to follow. So that's a big deal when you have kids, Steve. Uh, yeah, I know it is. <laughs> I just uh, earlier I didn't uh, give you an update on our staffing at the police department, and I like to share that with you because it has been a, a big thing for us over the last several years. Uh, our 911 dispatch center remains to be full staff, um, and uh, the police side of the house we have one opening right now, so we're making headway there. Uh, we do have uh, one of our new police officers that's at the Basic Police Academy right now due to graduate in September, so. We're excited about that. And then uh, Officer Jones that you met tonight, uh, he's obviously in training and uh, and won't be done until early next year sometime. But uh, And also I wanted to follow up uh, uh, what Commissioner Scarfo shared with you guys about the Cascadia event. It was really, I, I, I was very pleased to be part of something and see uh, our city staff work in such a way that uh, you might have read about that in the media, but I also wanted to share with you because we have talked a lot about uh, the wildland urban inter interface and other crisis that might happen within our community. And really that exercise and what we did there with the ICS structure and all the components that we worked in the, the people and the uh, agencies and organizations, public health, uh, Red Cross, uh, some of our utilities uh, were involved. Um, those are the same, uh, you know, agencies, organizations, and the, the ICS structure that we use that we would uh, bring to to bear in other emergencies or other crises. So, uh, I just wanted to share with you that it was it was a good exercise, and behind the scenes, we're working very hard to be sure that we're ready. Uh, we hope that these things don't ever happen, but hope is not a real good management tool. So, so Chief, in 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 a in a snapshot, give us what the Cascadia event would be more in impactful to the west side of the state as far as i know and what what, what will we planning for here uh, in case the quake hit us and shook us around a little bit or are we like the receiver of the refugees escaping the west yes and yes okay uh, so I, it's interesting because i had the same question i hadn't really looked at what is a cascadia earthquake event look like and and the fact of the matter is that the scenario uh demonstrated a number of landslides here within Union County. There was uh, some infrastructure that was damaged. Uh, the Second Street Viaduct as part of the, the, the exercise had structural damage and was not able to be used for a period of time. So uh, the exercise, uh, really what it does is it tests our public works, uh, our public safety, Red Cross, because as you stated, a number of people uh, you know, we're uh, expected to, to come to Union County uh, in a refugee status, needing housing, uh, things like that. There was uh, fuel shortages because with something like that, even though we may not have been impacted as significantly as the coastal or west side of, of the United States or, or our coast, um, the, the supply chains would be interrupted. So there would be a, a series of crises, if you will, that we would have to respond to in a fashion to uh, maintain our our, our well-being here. So uh, it, it really exercised all of that. And as you guys well know, um, it's one thing if, if, if I at the police department or Emmett at the fire department, you know, works through our emergency response plans. But when you get together and you actually exercise that together and communicate that and see how you you're able to, to work in concert, 
it, it was a it was a very valuable training exercise that I think I wanted to share with you that that would uh, be beneficial regardless of what the crisis is or the source of the emergency. So it, it was useful. Was, was National Guard involved or was uh, it just local agencies? Uh, there was actually four counties okay. um, that, that were involved uh, in Eastern Oregon and we were communicating from each of the emergency operations centers. Uh, and I don't think National Guard was involved uh, in, a, um, in a scenario based way, but in reality, they weren't there. Right. Yeah. I, and I and I mentioned that I'm intrigued by this because we had a, a when I was at EOU we had an MBA student Jorge Deanda who is now head of the National Guard here and his MBA project was a review of how his unit would respond in the event of a Cascadia event and um, and what well, how they would be deployed for events around the state. Uh, it might be worthwhile connecting with him to see what, what work he's come out of and to get an idea of how they're prepped for a situation like It never happens, but um, if it does, it's not going to be a, a pretty scene for anybody on the West Coast. So Much better to be prepared than, yes, than to, not. to not be. Thank you very much, Chief. Anyone else? Interim city manager comments. Oh, thanks, Mayor. I, I, I actually don't have anything. It's probably more of an urban renewal comment, but I'm going to throw it out there now as you have a special session next Wednesday, July 13th. So anyway, just a reminder. Oh, Kyle's, Kyle's up. Oh, I see you there, Kyle. Go ahead. Oh, looks like it's uh, nice there. Can you hear us? Send him, send him a survey. We, we can't hear you. And oh, he's gone. Am I back now? I hear you now. Okay, I'm not going to turn on the cam because it doesn't look like my uh, bandwidth is large enough to uh, okay, run a video. Well, at the same but time. you're not, you're not in Union County. So I'm afraid the, the none of the money from Dang here it. is available. Well, it was worth Go a ahead. shot. Hey, I just wanted to update you guys on a couple of projects that are going. So if you haven't noticed, the crews will be out tomorrow finishing up the paving on Hall Street. So hopefully we will have that open for the weekend and uh, we can start the new drag races to the new part of town and they'll come off a of second street. Uh, after that, we're going to move over to S Avenue, which is uh, kind of over by Anderson Perry by Fur. So we're going to be hitting another street to get that one overlaid after we do a little bit of sewer work. But uh, the project that has been getting the most interest is the downtown ramps. So as you know, we've got crazy days coming up next week and we have a few ramps that are ripped up and looking a little bit bad. Let me assure you all areas inside where crazy days will take place will be back together in time for the celebration. Uh, we will be working down on Hemlock, which I believe is outside most of the activities of downtown. So uh, everything should be good there. Uh, it's a pretty exciting project. That's the one that we thought was going to be about 150 and ended up being $600,000. So progress is moving along, and uh, that's what I got for you today. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Um, anybody hey, else? Can I ask? Hey, Kyle, are you still yep. there? Yep. When does uh, the project on Geckler start? You know, I am finishing the design this week. We hope to have documents out for bidding. We hope to award the contract in August. So my hope is by September, we got that thing rolling. So okay. we went out to the field. The The original estimate was kind of just a, a, a real generic design that was slapped over a footprint. We're kind of catering that. We did some investigating, cored, some, cored the pavement to see what thicknesses are there and are uh, building up the design to what we found in that, in that investigation. So we anticipate having that for you guys to award at the next meeting okay good um just just a comment uh, that is more sort of in line with county stuff but the second street viaduct over the river and the highway is now open um and that's like 18 days short of when they said it would be so odot's to be commended for expediting that project and the surface looks good um so i just thought i'd bring that out and um so the people, they don't have to go around the long way to get to Maranao. They can go straight over the viaduct. Um, 
Any other staff comments or questions for staff? City managers, good. Council comments. I'm going to start with Council Lillard. Any comments? Can't hear you. Okay, no comments. Councilor Lillard, excuse me, Miesner. No. No. Councilor Bozarth? I'm good. Councilor Glabe? I did have one. Um, we got an email from Lee Morgan Cities this week. I don't know if any of you followed it, but there was a link there saying there's still quite a bit of state money um, related to COVID-19 funding. Mm -hmm. And one of the options for that was um, they said it, there's a number of things that it can be used for, but they're encouraging people to apply for this money because the state is facing the same kind of restrictions we are. If we don't apply by a certain date, if the money hasn't been used, it goes back to the federal government. And um, one of the, the uses that apparently other cities had successfully applied for was bringing um, water and sewer in to certain areas of the city where, you know, maybe there had been less access or something. And I sent an email to Robert, but I, I know he's out. And so I, I hadn't got a reply yet, but just, just to make you all aware that I think that's probably a worthy thing to, to talk with the staff about um, pursuing, you know, if we have some projects that we can use for that. And, and what came to mind was the fair, uh, the fairgrounds. And I don't know if we can make something like that apply, but, but if that can help with some funding there um, or, or, you know, ease, ease some of the barriers that we talked about in the past to that um, may, maybe that's a worthy pursuit. Okay. And let, let's make sure that Robert gets back to us on that yeah. one when, when he gets. So Mike, if you can make a note to have Robert, get to us on that. I will. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? No. Council Rock. And I'm good. So we are going to adjourn and I'm going to give Brent 10 seconds of quiet time. So I'm adjourning the city council meeting and we'll be back here momentarily. Yes, you will get that. I noticed that, but I was... Oh, yes, it's sitting on my desk. I will call you right early. Six, six too early, Stu? All right. You good, Brent? Okay. I'm going to call to order a meeting, a regular session for the Urban Renewal Agency, July 6, 2022. And uh, just mention that uh, two of the agency members are participating electronically. And ask for a roll call, please. Steve Clemens. Here. Gary Lillard. Gary, are you here? Here. here. Okay. John Bozar. Here. David Glabe. Here. Marianne Meisner. Looks like Marianne might have stepped out. We know she's here, we know but she's we here. will document that when she shows back up. Sounds good. Justin Rock. Here. Okay. Um, nothing on the dais for changes in agenda. We have one item, consent agenda, with uh, the regular minutes from June 1st. I'm going to entertain a motion on that consent agenda. I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. All right. Um, I see Marianne has joined us again, so... Just in time for the consent agenda vote. Can, consent agenda vote. Could I have a roll call vote on that, please? Steve Clemens. Yes. Gary Lillard. Yes. John Bozar. Yes. David Glabe. Yes. Marianne Meisner. Can't hear you. <laughs> yes. Justin Rock. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Consent agenda passed. Public comment, anyone wish to address the agency on a non-agenda item? All right, no public hearings, no unfinished business, two items of new business. The first one is approving recommended change to the call for projects policy. Timothy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the agency. Um, this is actually a pretty minor change to the policy. Um, we did, um, update the policy earlier this year um i think we amended it at the march 2nd meeting and uh, we added a section at that time providing preference to points to encourage additional residential development on the upper floors within the central business district the change also removes the requirement
for such projects to include retail improvements on the ground floor to be eligible for funding if they were located in the central business zone. Um, in reviewing the submissions for the 2022 call for projects, uh, we discovered a gap in our scoring model, specifically uh, that under the impact on central business zone criteria, there is not a provision, or, uh, excuse me, there is not a provision for housing residential only project located in the central business zone. So on May 4th, our district manager um, informed the agency and your rack of the oversight and indicated that staff would be allocating 25 points for this type of project while scoring the CFPs uh, applications that were coming in with the understanding that we would come back to the agency and the agency would need to approve that policy change prior to the July uh, session to award funding. Um, the recommendation, uh, recommendation, excuse me, the recommended revision that is in your packet also uh, has one other change, and that is um, that the draft also removes some unnecessary language at the very end of the last paragraph on the last page. So pretty minor changes, uh, really driven by just an oversight um, when we amended the scoring uh, piece of this in March. So. Um, okay, so I mean, it, it, just to call attention to this, um, really the only change that I see other than the last paragraph you mentioned is on page two in the table, you added a housing and residential only located in the CBZ and a point score for that. That's the, that's the it takes care of it. So it was, you're right, a very minor change. Um, the only question that I have is why 25? Well, you know, I mean, does that reflect our desire for residential development uh, above ground floor in downtown? And, and I'm curious to know. So, yes, and my understanding, I mean, talking with the um, with the agency manager um, and with the, the feedback from the agency at our last meeting, that 25 point scale was really based on the priority that the agency has given to increasing residential, uh, particularly within the central business zone. Questions for Timothy? Anybody? Uh, we, we lost Gary. Brett, Gary's not no longer up there. Is he? Is he? Did he check out, or is he? Okay, so he has a bandwidth. He, yeah, has a bandwidth issue. You need some money for improving his connection. Um, <laughs> any questions for Timothy on this? Pretty straightforward. And just as 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 um, Mike reminded us, we have a meeting next Wednesday night. Uh, where we will actually put that change into play. How would this be scored if somebody was, would these be considered separate projects if someone was revising a downtown building, but also doing something to the upper floor? Because they, I mean, some projects I could see, you know, it would be dual nature. I guess it's the word only uh, that I, I want some clarification on. So I think that came out of a discussion and in fact, a proposal that you'll see in your packet for the July 13th special meeting. Um, historically, when somebody was has worked on a project downtown, um, that has typically been a building renovation. So they had something going on on the ground floor, redeveloping the upper floor simultaneously. Um, this particular clause was put in there because we realized that we may in fact have a building where perhaps there is already an existing ground floor tenant the outside of the building, you know, the shell itself has been pretty well maintained, restored, and the only work happening at that point is the residential conversion of an upper floor or upper floor unit um, to housing. So, so that concept of we're only we're only doing work on the second floor is fairly new. Uh, historically, projects have involved the majority of the structure and not just a residential. Uh, apartment development. So, um, and we also did stipulate um, that 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 particular clause is only relevant within the central business zone. So, if somebody were in the 
um, urban renewal area, but outside of the central business zone, um, using funding for residential would still have to be part of a mixed use uh, project um, that would include a retail component on ground floor. So, so remind, re remind me again, the central business zone is Adams from fourth out to um, believe it's out. I believe it's from fourth um, out to um, Highland Avenue. Okay. I think we end right there at Highland. Okay. But just just at just uh, just Adams. Um, Adams and uh, Jefferson and Washington okay. basically right. were about three blocks wide. Okay. Any other questions? Public comments. Agency discussion. A motion. I move that the agency amend the call for projects policy to add to a new scoring criteria under impact on central business zone for a housing residential only project located in the central business zone as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Right. We have a motion and a second. Any other conversation, discussion? Roll call vote, please. Steve Clemens. Yes. Gary Lillard. Yes. John Bozarth. Yes. David Glabe. Yes. Marianne Meisner. Yes. Justin Rock. Yes. Motion passes. All right. Next item on the agenda. Let me hold on a second. Make sure I've got. I lost my agenda here. Where did it go? Yeah, we only have one other item of new business. So that is uh, appointment to the Urban Renewal Advisory Commission. That is uh, my responsibility. We have, um, usually we have something here, but I'm assuming that we have, uh, the, the URAC is a five member uh, committee. And um, I think we must have at least one vacancy because we have one applicant. So I move that Ricky Joe Hickey be appointed to the Urban Renewal Advisory Commission for the remainder of a three-year term, which will expire December 31st, 2024. Second. You want it? Uh, it so actually it. below it says that it will fill the commission. Okay, got it. Um, so roll call vote, vote, please. Steve Clemens? Yes. Gary Lillard? Yes. John Bozarth? Yes. David Glabe? Yes. Marianne Meisner? Yes. Justin Rock? Yes. Motion passes. All right, so that finishes that up um comments other than to tell us that we have a special work session for the urban renewal agency next wednesday that's it okay agency comments marianne nope gary i'm good john good dave justin good. we're adjourned